around and see the God in every face. What a beauty each of you is. And what a great way to begin to talk about one of our core values, uplifting. So we're doing a romp through core values, the ones that we've recently adopted. And that today we're looking at being uplifted and uplifting each other. This is what the core value says. We enthusiastically engage in the transformation of ourselves, our church, our community, and the world. Let's say that together. We enthusiastically engage in the transformation of ourselves, our church, our community, and the world. And you see the rest of the core values. We are spiritual, uplifting, dynamic, loving, and inclusive as a community. The key word here is, I see this, transformation. We begin with us in transformation. And that transformation begins to ripple out across the universe. It ripples out into this community. Have you been with somebody ever that gets on fire for something? They're passionate. They're excited for something. And you might not even be specifically interested in that something, but their passion ignites something in you and you just want to hear more about it. Have you had that experience before? Yeah. So that's what we do. We get excited about life. We, and then we ripple that out. It begins with us. Transformation always begins with us. And then we begin to ripple it out. As we think about transformation, we're not looking at needing to fix some part of us that's broken. We're not needing to look at what's wrong with us. In transformation, we're really inviting our openness to learning, our openness to discovery about life, our openness to see what wants to happen next and how amazing can we be as human beings. That's what we're looking at in terms of transformation. You know, how magnificent can we be and how much can we express our wholeness and our divinity? And again, it begins with us. You can think about transformation like we are that drop in the water. And here's an illustration for you. We're the drop that goes into water and it begins to ripple out in concentric ripples or like concentric circles. It begins with us. Our excitement in coming here can ignite something in others who have come here in this spiritual community. We take that out into the greater Wilmington community, and then it begins to ripple across the world. One person can make a difference. I want to give us a starting point. These are quotes from Eric Butterworth, who was a unity minister for many years and has written a gazillion books. He says that the starting point in spiritual realization is a right understanding of that one designated as the Almighty. Now we can take spiritual realization and just simply put spiritual transformation in place there. Understanding of that one designated as the Almighty. In Eric Butterworth's day, there was talk of God as the Almighty. You, know, you might have remembered that from wherever you grew up in the Southern Baptist, where I grew up, that was evident. We talked about Almighty God. You can Shift Almighty, you can put whatever word you want to put in there. That's the cool thing about unity. You put whatever your favorite word for God is right there. The one designated. We say this, we affirm the one designated every single Sunday when we say there is only one presence and one power active in the universe. There is only one presence and one power active in our lives. And when we begin to recognize that, when we begin to embrace that, when we begin to take that one presence on and live it, then we have truly discovered the power that is within each of us. That power to create our lives, that power to move forth and create the life of our dream. It's that way that the universe responds to us. It's that way that God responds to us. And that's that way that when we get the diagnosis, when the huge bill that's unexpected comes due, when somebody dies or we have a breakup, it's that way when we come home to that spiritual principle that teaches us how to live, that invites us to live our fullest, we can look beyond the appearance of things and trust and have faith that good will come out of it whatever it is, because God, that one presence, is principle. 
And from that principle, it's like unchanging, immutable, limitless, exact, definite. And so we can count on that. And we can count on the fact that what we bring to that energy, that powerful energy that we call God, that what we bring to it is what's going to expand. We are spiritual beings that are having a human experience that are governed by physical laws. But we're also governed by spiritual laws, divine laws. And those laws, when we apply them, are what we use to em embrace and expand our world and our lives and create that world where we truly can experience love, harmony with each other, and peace in the midst of our differences. And here's a little bit about how it works. Oh, I'm going to go on and say this. God is a sphere who centers everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. This is Eric Butterworth's definition of God. I think it's amazing because what it's really saying is the same thing we say all the time. God is everywhere present. And another way to say this is, I am the center of God. If you're willing to own that, will you say that with me? I am the center of God. So we are the ones that flow through the love. We are the ones that bring the support to each other. We're the ones who, when somebody is hurting, can gather around and say, we know this will pass, and until you know it, we're going to hold that vision for you. We're the ones, when somebody is down and out, or feeling like they're not good enough, we can say, I see your wholeness, no matter what you think about yourself. That is a form of uplifting each other. Here's how it works. We're the center of God. So we have a belief system. All of us have a belief system, whether that belief system is what we consider a negative belief system or a positive belief system. We hold a belief system. Those beliefs come from the experiences that we've had throughout our lives. Our subconscious mind will collect an image or a thought or a word about all the experiences that we have had. And then from that, from those plethora of experiences, we get, begin to develop a belief. And eventually those beliefs expand into a worldview. And then however we see the world, we're going to begin to live out of that worldview. So here's how it works. If I have a negative belief about myself that I'm not enough, then when I get laid off from my job and I'm holding that belief that I'm not enough, one of the first things I'm going to think, and one of the first decisions that I'm going to make is, jobs are hard to get. I might never get another job. Other people are more qualified than me. And so then when I'm holding that belief, I'm going to do things that sabotage my ability to get a job. I might write a sloppy resume. I might be late for an interview. I might go in and say, something that I would, shouldn't say or know I shouldn't say, but there I catch myself saying it, I just can't seem to stop myself from talking about it. And <laughs> the people who are there listening who are interviewing me are like, ooh, not so good. <laughs> Maybe we don't want to hire her. But out of those beliefs, that's what we do. Here's another example. I'm in a breakup, and I think I'm not lovable. And believe me, I did this for a lot of my life. And I think, oh, I'll never love again. And I walked around for years saying, how could anybody ever love me? I mean, it's kind of funny now to me. It's a way to see my past and look at how far I've come. But when we hold these beliefs, when we carry them in us, when we live them, then we create a reality because we're living from those beliefs. When I feel like I'm not good enough, when I feel like I'm not lovable, no, how, no matter how much is reflected to me from other people that I am, I'm going to have a much more difficult time taking it in. And we all do it in sort of odd ways. Oh, what a beautiful new dress you have. Oh, this whole thing. <laughs> but we do it in all kinds of ways. We give appreciation to somebody, and they deflect that appreciation. It's a way of saying, hey, you know, maybe I'm not thinking as highly of myself as you do. But when we are uplifting each other, we still hold the knowing that we are, are all standing in our wholeness, whether we know it or not. And when we choose 
to see only that wholeness about somebody else, eventually that vibration, they'll get on board. Might be slowly at first, but eventually they'll get on board or, or they will oscillate out. But when we're willing to hold it, we are uplifting each other. We are supporting each other. We are saying, hey, I think you are magnificent. Now it works the other way too. When we're holding positive beliefs, when I get laid off, I might hold the belief, I have many skills. I can't wait to see what the next job is. I'm looking forward to it. What I know is every single job that I've had is better than the job before. When the breakup happens, and I know I'm enough and I know I'm lovable, then I know that I will love again. And somebody's going to be lucky that I love them again. <laughs> I can go that far, somebody. So I don't have to walk around with other beliefs. And then I'm radiating love. When I'm radiating love for myself, people are drawn to me. They want to be with us. When we're uplifting, when we're joyful, when we're excited about life, people want to be around us. Have you ever been around somebody that when you leave, oh, it's like, whoa, I was drained. I'm, I'm kind of glad I've left. You know, I like them, but I'm kind of glad I'm left. Well, I like to spend my time with folks like you who, when I'm around you, there's a fun capacity to experience joy and that we celebrate each other. The good news is it doesn't matter what our belief is. We, get the, we have the right through free will to hold any negative beliefs that we want to hold. We have a right to hold positive beliefs. What transformation is really all about is sifting through those beliefs. Does this one work for me now? Nah, I don't think so. I'm going to toss it out the window. Does this one work for me? Oh yeah, I like this one. It supports my health, wholeness. It supports my health. It supports my growth. Most of us began to develop the beliefs before we had the cognitive capacity to actually say, yes, when this one fits. Yes, this one fits me. No, that one doesn't fit me. Or we came into beliefs where our families had already established certain beliefs, and we began to take them on, kind of marinated in them. And if you want to know a very easy example, think about the toilet paper roll. You know, does it hang over or does it hang under? <laughs> this has been a conflict in many couple experiences. <laughs> you know, if you want to fight about something, you can almost always find something in those little day-to-day -day details of life. Or you can say, wow, does it matter? Or you could play a game, I'm in there, I'm going to put it my way. Somebody else is in there, they're going to put it their way. And so we're going to always know who's in there last. If we <laughs> you know, we could have fun with all of this. We can celebrate our differences, embrace them, and play with each other around our differences. Here's some other ways. Beliefs can support us or they can hinder us. This is a limiting choice belief. I'm type A personality and I just can't change my impatience. You can put any word other than impatience in there. What is it that you believe is a core part of you that you cannot change? People are just not as committed as I am to producing high quality work. If I'm thinking that, then I'm going to require people around me to not produce very much so I can look good in my own eyes. And I'm probably the only eyes I look good in. But I'm good at that. No matter what I do, there's never going to be enough time to get things done. I have to admit, I kind of hold that belief still. I'm working on it. I'm working on that transformation. We also hold beliefs that can truly support us. I'm capable of continuous transformation. We live in an ever-expanding universe. We have infinite opportunities to grow, to develop, to discover, to be a new version of ourselves. Other people are doing the best they can. When we hold that for each other, then when I don't do my very best, somebody's going to hold that for me. And they're not going to say, oh, you know, Nikki, you didn't do a very good job. But they're going to come through and they're going to say, wow, thank you, you did the best you could. And that's a gift. Have you ever had the experience of working really hard at something and you were so excited about it and you were so proud of what you accomplished and somebody came along and said, oh, is that all you did? 
<laughs> or that grade, I worked so hard in math and sciences, the hard sciences, not the social ones, but the hard sciences. Yeah. I worked so hard in those. And I felt really proud for the C or the B that I got. And often my mother would say, how come you didn't get an A? Everything else might be an A, but there was that one piece that somebody wanted to nitpick at. And we can do that. There's something for all of us in that. But we can also make a different choice. We can choose differently. I can find the time I need to accomplish whatever I truly want. I love this one because I have a lot of diverse wants. And I like to play with all of them. We're always making choices. We're always choosing. Am I going to step into a belief that I've held for a long time that no longer serves me? Am I going to focus on the belief that I am magnificent, that you are magnificent, that when I look at you, I see the face of God? Because when I focus on that belief and I look at you and I see the face of God, I'm going to treat you differently than when I look at you and say, oh, well, you know, hmm, you're not measuring up to me today. You're not quite up to your game. But when I'm willing to look and see your wholeness and hold only your wholeness, in my consciousness, I'm going to see your beauty, no matter what else shows up. I'm going to see your preciousness, no matter what else shows up. I had a friend once who walked through the middle of a coup in Egypt with a group of students on a Toltec mystery tour. And they got back to their hotel, and they turned on the TV, and they were so shocked to see that they had walked through the middle of this coup because all they saw was the beauty of the earth as they moved through there. They were divinely protected because that's what they observed and saw. She's an amazing Toltec master who's teaching her students to live in the same way we're inviting here in this spiritual community, inclusiveness and upliftedness. Another way to look at this is there is a Zen master and his student who was perpetually unhappy. No matter what the master taught, the student was unhappy. So the master said to the student one day, grab a bag of, or handful of salt out of that bag and put it in this bowl. And the student did that and stirred it around and the master said, mm, take a drink of that now. And the student took a drink, you can imagine what it might have tasted like, very salty and yucky. And the student said, oh, that's awful. And this, the master said, grab another handful and let's take a walk to the lake. So they walked together to the lake. And they talked as they walked. And they experienced, the master at least, experienced the beauty of the nature as they walked to the lake. And the, the master said, take that handful of salt and put it in the lake and stir it around now. And the student did. And the master said, take a drink now. And the student did. And there was no scrunched up face. It was like it was a clear lake with delicious water. The salt taste was gone. And the master said, the salt is very much like the pain of life. When we hold it close, when we put it in a small container, then it's going to be yucky. But when we expand it out and put it in a large container, it dissipates so we don't even experience even the taste of the salt. We have that choice every moment of every day. We have the opportunity to drink of the yucky salt water or to drink of the cool, delicious water of the lake. Does it have salt or pain in it? Yes. Does life have pain in it? Yes. How do we choose to experience that pain? And that's all based on our belief systems. We are changing culture as a spiritual community. We are inviting a new way of seeing. It's the same way of seeing that Jesus invited that was radical in his day. And it looks like this. In, when Jesus came to walk on the earth, God was a punitive lawgiver and judge. There were 613 laws that people must obey, dietary laws and ways of being, and you had to sacrifice animals, and there were a lot of things that people had to do. A person's worth was measured by their social standards. Were you a Sadducee? Were you a Pharisee? Were you just a regular old person? Were you a farmer? Did you own anything? 
and your social status determined how you were treated. Sinners and outcasts were to be avoided and rejected. Women were outcasts in that community in many ways. If you were ill, you were outcast. If you were the parent of a blind child, you were outcast. Because something must be wrong with you that this is what happened, that your child was born blind. And yet Jesus came and said, oh, I'm not putting up with this anymore. The left side, this is what I would call conventional wisdom. The right side, God is gracious. All persons have infinite worth as an expression of God. Everyone is welcome in the kingdom of God. This is the wisdom of love. This is the wisdom of what Jesus taught us and invited us into. Again, the choice is ours. We can choose to live on the left side, or I guess it would be, yeah, it would be your left side, or we can choose to live in the bold. And it's bolded because it is a bold way of living. God is gracious. I would translate as God is grace. What that means in unity is that we do not reap as much as we sow. We teach the law of mind to action. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. The law of grace is that when I hold a thought, I might not reap that thought because God is absolute good. So I don't have to reap that thought. Now if I hold it for long enough, if I hold it tight enough, if I hold it boldly enough, yes, I'm going to reap it. But if it just comes through my consciousness and I make a different choice, then I don't need to reap the consequences of that thought. To me, that's exciting. To me, that calls us to responsibility. It gives the control to us. And for those of you who are called control freaks, that's what we can control. You know, I'm a bit of a control freak. That's what I can control. I can control my own behavior. I can control my thinking by making a different thought. Think a better feeling thought. I can do that. Or I can choose, and it's okay. We have the right to do whatever we do. I can choose to think that I'm a jerk. I can choose to think that I don't know how to do something very well. And I can live from that consciousness. Or I can make a different choice. I can choose to believe that I'm magnificent, that I'm wondrously made. I can choose to believe that about you no matter what you do. And that is what we're being called into, being as radical as Jesus, living boldly in our love for one another, <coughs> choosing to forgive rather than to blame, choosing appreciation over criticism, choosing to live free of gossip, free of hurting each other, Purposefully, Sometimes we're going to hurt each other accidentally. And then we say, I'm so sorry. That was not the intention I held. But we come from a, a place of humbleness. The early church had difficulties. Just like we have difficulties, there was gossip. People took their toys and they went home because they got mad. There were differences. All the things that any people that have differences experience coming together occurred in the early church. But what the teaching was over and over was to love boldly and to encourage one another and build one another up just as you were doing, just as we are doing. Encouraging can be translated as uplifting. As a spiritual community, we are calling ourselves to uplift each other. and This is how we do it. Live from our own incredible worth. Say with me, I hold incredible worth. I hold incredible worth. Each of us is created in the image and likeness of God, so we have all those capacities. If we choose to develop one, develop any one of them, we will make a difference for ourselves and each other. To see each other's wholeness, to be committed to living as your best self, one of the relationship commitments that I have is to always bring the best of me home. I can do the worst of me out there, but I always want to bring the absolute best of me home. So that's what I experience in my home. I want to be a gossip-free zone. Something I learned teaching in Orlando last week was I can say my spiritual practice is to not engage in gossip. So one of my students taught me that because we were talking about things that happen as leaders in spiritual communities. 
And that's what she taught me. I'm like, oh, I'm taking on that as the spiritual practice. I can choose to stop blame and criticism. When I have a criticism, I can make a request for something to be different. And I have the freedom to make that request. When I'm filled with criticism, I can look inside and say, what in me is being pushed? What buttons are being pushed? Instead of saying it's you that's pushing them, but wow, what's up for healing for me that I would like to clear? And we can celebrate each other's success. What is the success that one of you have had this week? Would you be willing to share it? I'm hearing the murmurs. Yes, what's the success? I, I was more loving this week. Yay! Yeah. Let's celebrate that. What's the other success? What is something you did well, Phyllis? We had a fellowship meeting. Yes! Yes. <laughs> yes, where we're developing bonds for each other. Let's celebrate the coming together of people having a good time. Yay! Yeah. What's another one, a success? Yes. My dear son, who I haven't seen in many years due to heroin, spent three days with me this week. Yay! Yay. Yay. And I'm imagining that each of us if we had the time, could raise our hands and share its success. And so my invitation is when you're fellowshipping after church, share those successes with each other. Tell about the best thing that happened to you this week. Uplift each other and celebrate each other as you do that. Let's say this again. We enthusiastically engage in the transformation of ourselves, our church, our community, and the world. How do we know when we're doing it? We warmly welcome newcomers. And I would actually say each other. I love to say hello to you guys as you're coming in on Sunday. I celebrate others' joy. I encourage them on their spiritual journey. Celebrating each other. When we're with people who are celebrating us, well, I don't know about you, I want to do even more. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for my gifts, and I claim joy today. Claim your joy in this moment. I claim my joy in this moment. I claim my joy in this moment. And let's say together, if you're interested, but only if you're interested. I am the center of God. I uplift myself and others. With gratitude. Let's be grateful for ourselves in this spiritual community for each other supporting and encouraging and celebrating us. And let's take that gratitude into song and then into meditation with our gratitude song.